So before we continue, I want to explain very quickly about a hadith. What is a hadith? Basically, there's two types of hadith. There are hadith that are acceptable, maqbul, and then hadith that are mardud, that are rejected. Basically, a hadith describes the, um, the actions and the, or gives the speech or the tacit approvals of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The af'al, the um, aqwal, and the taqarir. Um, so, so there's a difference now between hadith and sunnah, right? Um, obviously, there's overlap. We, 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 uh, we draw or extract the sunnah from the hadith, um, but they're not necessarily the same things. There's a lot of hadith. There's thousands upon thousands of hadith at different grades. We'll talk briefly about that. Anything that is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is considered to be a hadith, uh, but the sunnah of the prophet, right? Uh, this is what has the sort of provid providential protection, the protection of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, this is the the authoritative uh, or normative ethos, um, the authenticated practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi. And the function of the sunnah, as the scholars of Islam say, al-ulama, as sunnah to tufassir al-Qur'an. That the sunnah, really what it does is that it exegetes, if you will, or it explains the Qur'an, right? So the Qur'an itself says in Surah to, uh, Nahal, Surah number 16, verse 44, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed we sent down this dhikr upon you, this reminder upon you, speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ In order for you to make bayan, in order for you to make clear, right, to explicate, to elucidate, to commentate upon what was revealed to them, to, um, to, to uh, interpret the Qur'an, the revelation of God. This is uh, one, of the, um, one of the functions of, of prophecy. So just because you read something in a hadith doesn't necessarily mean it's true, even if it's considered to be in a, a sound book of hadith. There are a lot of problems with, with hadith that are graded as sound. There's difference of opinion about them. You might read something that is sound uh, and try to implement it, but implement it incorrectly. For example, one of my teachers years ago, he quoted a hadith that the Prophet used to eat dates, uh, but what's the proper way of eating it? What's the proper etiquette? Pop it in your mouth and you spit out the seed. How did the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how did he eat a date? Right? He would put it into his mouth with his right hand, and then he would extract the seed by turning his left hand over with these two fingers and push the seed out with his tongue, but no one actually saw his tongue, and then he'd discard, or he would get rid of uh, the seed. So he did it in a way where there's, um, there's um, a lot of honor, um, and there wasn't, there, there's no question about having you know, bad adab or, or having bad comportment while, while, while eating. Uh, how, how does a Muslim pray? I mean, the Quran tells us to pray, but how do we pray? Can you pray any way you want to? Can you just kind of follow what your neighbor is doing or what Christians and Jews are doing? Is that how we pray? So the sunnah becomes absolutely indispensable um, in uh, understanding uh, the Quran. How do we send benedictions upon the Prophet? Uh, the Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O you who believe, right, send benedictions of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. How do we do that? We have to look at the sunnah, or the authenticated hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And it's a meticulous science. We don't have to go into it now. It's a separate class. But basically for a, a hadith to be sound, Right? The, there's, a, there's a sanad, which is the chain of transmission. It has to be mutasil. It has to be linked. There has to be a link, no missing, uh, no gaps in the link of transmission. Um, the famous hadith of mercy has 23 or 24 uh, um, links in its chain of transmission. This is the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
is reported to have said, and you'll find it in Musnad Ahmad, Al Rahimun, Yarhamu Humur Rahman, Irhamu Manfil Ard, Yarhamkum Manfis Sama, or Yarhamukum Manfis Sama, O Kamakala Alihi Salatu was Salam, that the most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on earth, and the one in heaven, in no anthropomorphic sense, will show you compassion. This hadith is called Hadith al Rahmah. There's, like I said, about two dozen or so links in its chain of transmission. Uh, and it is uh, indisputable, the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and this is actually the first hadith that Muslim children in the traditional Muslim world were taught. This would sort of set the foundation for their education about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi um, stressing the importance of compassion, the, the importance of, of mercy. So the chain of transi transmission is muttasil, there's no gaps, everyone in the chain has adala, there's, there's, they have probity, they're known as being righteous people, they have tam adapt, they have intelligence, they have good memories, there's no hidden uh, problems, no hidden illa, right? Um, which could be anything from like bad grammar, because the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not use bad or incorrect grammar. He was the most eloquent uh, of speakers. <clears throat> So, so this is a very meticulous science, the, the science of hadith authentication. And this is different than sirah, right? With sirah, you have to be careful. A lot of things get into sirah that have no chain of transmission. Um, so it's up to the ulama to go through and sort of sift through uh, the sirah and extract what is authentic to what is not. Uh, writers of sirah tend to exaggerate uh, certain things. And it's interesting because the sirah, <clears throat> is uh, something that is constantly under attack uh, by, for example, Christian apologists, Christian missionaries. They tend to attack stories in Sira, and many of these stories uh, are exaggerations, um, even according to Muslim scholars. Some of these stories have, like I said, no chain of transmission, and no Muslim really takes them seriously. But these are the things that are brought up by missionaries, for example, so basically tearing down a straw man. The example that I give, uh, the, the, the equivalent of, of that is, for example, if I said something like, if I went to a Christian and I said, you know, why did Jesus murder one of his teachers? Now, of course, I don't believe this at all. Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, is a great prophet of God in the Islamic tradition. But just to make a point here, um, and he says, well, what are you talking about? I said, no, it, oh, it's, that's, it's what it says. And in, uh, in the infancy gospel of Thomas. Well, he would say, well, the infancy gospel of Thomas is, is an apocryphal gospel. We don't believe in that. That's what he would say, right? We believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? I say, exactly, we don't believe in that. So many of these stories in Sirah um, are just, they're, they're falsified stories. No Muslim takes them seriously. There's no chain of transmission, and they have nothing to do with our faith. But this hadith, Hadith Gabriel, right, this is considered to be a sound hadith. It's recorded by Imam Muslim. <clears throat> it is a very famous hadith, uh, as I said. So the hadith begins, an Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the hadith is on the authority of one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, whose name was Umar, and Umar uh, was the second caliph um, in uh, Islam following uh, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, one of the most beloved human beings uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And generally, um, well, the, 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 Sun, the Sunni uh, tradition of Islam uh, uh, praise and love uh, uh, all of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They weren't all perfect, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a respect there, uh, and that's in contrast to the Shia, um, that don't respect uh, a great number or a majority of the companions uh, of the Prophet. So these are the two sort of major divisions in our tradition, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. And, the, and really, the I would say the differences, as far as theology goes, are minor, they're neg negligible. Some would disagree with that. Uh, but the vast majority of scholars on both sides do not anathematize either side. They don't make takfir. Right, um, but the major difference is really in probably um, political theory, political theology. <clears throat>
Uh, but nonetheless, <clears throat> the hadith begins by saying, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُرُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So Sayyidina Umar is saying that one day we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the title of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم here in Arabic, Rasulullah, a construct phrase, the Messenger of God. Rasul is equivalent probably to the Greek Apostle, which literally means one who is sent forth. And of course, the word for God in Arabic is Allah, and this is um, uh, the, the name of God in Arabic. But there, but in, in all Semitic languages, the the word for God begins with the alif and the lam, or alif and lamid. Um, so in uh, in Hebrew, you have Elo um, uh, as the singular, and Elohim, which is the plural of Majesty, which we find many many times in the Hebrew Bible. In Aramaic or Syriac, you have Allah, right? <clears throat> so Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, he would have used um, Allah because he spoke uh, Aramaic or, or Syriac. So for example, in Mark 1.15, uh, the, behold the kingdom of God, the Malkutha da Allah is at hand. So Jesus would have used this name for God, Allah. Um, so the Quran, uh, so in Arabic uses that name as well. So he's saying, we, we're sitting with the messenger of a God, peace be upon him, that a yeoman one day, and behold, a man rose among us, right? So the Arabic here suggests that he sort of just uh, seemingly appeared out of nowhere. Shadidu bayad thiyab, he was wearing exceedingly white clothes. Shadidu sawad shar he had exceedingly black hair. لا يرى عليه أثر السفر. The traces of travel was not seen on him. So, uh, you know, he didn't have. He wasn't dusty. He wasn't disheveled. Anything like that. He didn't look like a traveler. Didn't have, you know, a bag or something with him. ولا يعرفه من أحد. And none of us knew who he was. None of us recognized him. Right. So, this is uh, obviously. The Archangel Gabriel, right? Jibril alayhi salam. Jibril in Arabic, Gavriel in Hebrew, which means the power of God. <clears throat> and Gabriel would often uh, incarnate, that is to say, assume human flesh in order to teach human beings, right? Uh, so this is one of the ways in which the prophets would, uh, would interact with angels, that the angels would take human form. It's called incarnation. Muslims do not believe that God incarnates, right? So this is a major difference of opinion uh, between a major difference in theology, let's say between Hinduism and Islam or Christianity in Islam and Christian. So in Hinduism, there are countless incarnations of God. Uh, is, is Hinduism essentially a monotheistic religion? That's an interesting question that we can talk about later. In Christianity, God did not incarnate except for once, and that was in the person of Christ, according to Christians, and we'll talk about uh, that as well. So oftentimes, Gabriel would incarnate, and he would teach the Prophet. He's the teacher of the Prophet, although Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad's rank is higher than Gabriel. His rank is actually higher than his teacher, because the Prophet is the best of creation. He is the beloved of God. Right, so it's not, it's not all about knowledge, right? Um, you can have teachers that are uh, that are arrogant. You have students that surpass their teachers over time uh, in piety and even in knowledge. It's very very common. So, so Gabriel would come to the prophet. He would teach him uh, the religion, or he would bring the prophet Quran. He would bring the prophet revelation. Oftentimes, Gabriel, in, in human form, would simply tell the prophet to repeat after him. And the prophet would repeat, and that's called an exterior locution. Other times, the angel would come to the prophet, but was not seen by him. And the angel would uh, dictate to the prophet internally. The prophet would, uh, he would perceive words internally sounds forming words or vibrations forming words. 
and he would perceive that and then he would just repeat that and that's called an interior locution so the Quran would come to the Prophet in both ways and on rare occasion the Quran would come to the Prophet without any angelic uh, mediation right so interior locution without angelic mediation and our scholars like Imam Suyuti and others uh, scholars of Ulum al Quran or the sciences, um, or I'm using the word science and sort of the pre 1800 like, disciplines of the Quran, they would say that, uh, for example, the, the last two ayahs of Al Baqarah uh, were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by God, glorified and exalted as He, through interior locution without angelic mediation. And they mention others too. Well, duha wa layli idha saja, surah 93, and the surah that follows it, alam nashrah laka sadarak, wallahu alam. So here we have Gabriel, peace be upon him, the great archangel. He's taken on human form. He's wearing white clothes, very white clothes. He has exceedingly black hair, and no one recognizes him. So he comes and Sayyidina Umar, he continues, he says, hatta jalasa ilan nabi so that he sits right in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, to the point where he sort of touches or links his knees against his. So he's sitting right in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then Gabriel puts his hands on his thighs, on his own thighs, and he's listening intently. Um, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So here, Gabriel appears to be teaching us proper adab, sort of proper etiquette or comportment uh, with the Prophet. And this is very important um, for Muslims that we show proper respect towards all the Prophets of God, right? And of course, the Quran mentions about 25 of them, but the Hadith uh, indicates that there are thousands of Prophets. 25 mentioned in the Quran, and all of them are respected and loved by Muslims, right? So these include uh, even Adam, alayhi salam, the pro Adam is considered a prophet in Islam. Um, Noah is considered a prophet in Islam. Uh, Moses, peace be upon him, um, and uh, uh, before that, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and or Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac, both of them considered prophets in the Islamic tradition, both of them beloved by Muslims, both of them respected, both of them considered legitimate prophets and, and, and righteous. Uh, even Jacob is considered a prophet in Islam. So uh, these stories that are mentioned about, for example, Jacob in the book of Genesis, where he's really depicted uh, in a very negative way, right? Basically, as this kind of trickster, um, uh, and that's a kind of common sort of uh, literary device or uh, um, uh, literary character in ancient literature. That there's this trickster, trickster figure who is is considered to be um, very clever and gets his way by by obviously um, tricking people and. This is sort of praised in, in, in the book of Genesis, that God has this type of unconditional love uh, for Jacob, despite all of his faults. So things like that, Muslims will not um, confirm. So the dominant opinion, and we'll talk more about this as well, is that um, when the Quran speaks of the Torah that was revealed to Moses, peace be upon him, it's not talking about what is today considered the Torah. Right, because clearly there, there are stories in the so-called Torah of today that are uh, unacceptable from a theological standpoint, from an Islamic theological standpoint. There are many things in the Torah that we would consider to be uh, accurate uh, uh, and even true, but at the end of the day, uh, Muslims don't rely on any other scriptures. All of these scriptures from the perspective of the Quran and Islam have been abrogated. Islam has its own scripture. It is the Quran. Islam has its own sacred law, which is derived from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. <clears throat> so anyway, um, 
we were talking about proper comportment with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, the Imam of Medina in the second century, second half of the second century, uh, or right in the middle of the second century after Hijrah was Imam Malik ibn Anas, uh, who died, I believe, 179 Hijri. Uh, students would come to him and they would study fiqh, they would study jurisprudence, and they would study hadith. And when they would study fiqh, he would immediately begin teaching that. But if they wanted to study hadith, he would prepare himself. Oftentimes he would go and he would take a shower, he would wear white clothes, he would tie his turban, he would burn some incense, right, put on some musk. Why would he do that? Is because he's going to teach the words of the Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So out of respect for the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Mubarak mentions something interesting. He mentions that uh, one time, you know, Imam Malik ibn Anas, as we said, the Imam of Medina to Munawwara, he was teaching his famous hadith book, Al Muwatta, and uh, as he was as he was relating a hadith of the Messenger of God, uh, peace be upon him, they noticed that he he would he would cringe and his face would turn pale, and this would happen over and over again, but he wouldn't stop the hadith of the Prophet. So. Um, after he was done with the hadith, he told his students, look between my shirt and my back, and they saw that a scorpion had lashed him something like 14, 15, or 16 times. But he didn't want to cut off the speech of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. So he continued uh, with the hadith. So Gabriel, he sits in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sort of locking his knees and listening intently. And then he says, however, Ya Muhammad. So he, he calls to the Prophet, peace be upon him, by using his, his first name, right? And this was something that is prohibited to do. The companions uh, did not do that, right? They used the title of the Prophet. Even God in the Quran does not address the Prophet وسلم, directly uh, by using his uh, first name. He speaks about the Prophet by using his name. Um, in the third person, right? Muhammadur Rasulullah, for example. Wa ma Muhammadun illa Rasul, for example. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a title. Ya ayyuhar Rasul, ya ayyuhan nabiyu. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how to address the Prophet. So here, however, Gabriel is saying, Ya Muhammad. So the ulama say here that Gabriel is posing as a Bedouin to conceal his identity because the Bedouin were a bit uh, gruff. They were a bit rough around the edges. Or the ulama say that this prohibition uh, is not for the angels, but only for um, the, the human believers in the Prophet, peace be upon him. So in that sense, then Gabriel is actually sort of subtly revealing his identity. Nonetheless, he says, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-Islam. Tell me about al-Islam. Of course, this is the name of the religion. But in this hadith, according to the scholars of hadith, this seems to be uh, a reference to the sort of exoteric or exterior aspect of the religion, what sometimes philosophers of religion call the sort of lateral or horizontal aspect of the religion. Of course, it means submission, submission unto God. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, And then the Prophet responded to Gabriel by saying, الْإِسْلَامُ أَنْ تَشْهَدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Right? So Islam is to witness or to testify that there is no ilah, there is no deity, there is no God, except Allah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no ilah. Nothing deserves worship other than Allah. Nothing deserves worship. Nothing other than God has divine attributes. Nothing other than God has the intrinsic ability to help and or harm you. So this is what is testified on the tongue. Right, so this is the first pillar of Islam, uh, Islam, and tashhada, shahada, 
to testify and is done upon the tongue la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah this is when this is this is uh, 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 when a a convert wants to become muslim a proselyte becomes muslim they will utter the shih the shahada they will say ashhadu i witness i testify and la ilaha illallah there's no ilah there's no deity there's no divinity there's no other person that has divine attributes that deserves or merits worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And I bear witness that there is, uh, and I bear witness that the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God. So the Prophet himself, this is what he says here Al Islam, number one, and tashhada ad la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, is to testify that there is no deity other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of God. So one of my teachers, he said here, this is this is an, something uh, interesting. La ilaha, right? That's atheism. There is no God. Illallah, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or except God, capital G. So we're moving from atheism into deism now, that there is a God, and that this God um, is the sort of great architect of the universe, the creator of all things. And now we move into theism. So from atheism to deism to theism. So deism, God, is just impersonal, right? But when we say Muhammad Rasulullah and Muhammad is a messenger of God, this reveals the personal aspect of God. How does it do that? Well, it's, it shows or it is, it, it is evidence of God's loving nature that he sends human messengers for the guidance of humanity, right? So through his prophets, divine eminence uh, is, is revealed, this kind of closeness that God has to his creation. It is through the prophets. This is how God reveals his loving nature. So the Quran says, "Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatil alamin." Right? I always refer to this as sort of the equivalent of John three sixteen in the Quran. This is twenty one one o seven of the Quran, which the Prophet, in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he says, "We did not send you except as a mercy to all the worlds." Right? That the Prophet, peace be upon him is the greatest manifestation of God's mercy because the prophet is the greatest messenger of God. He brings us total guidance, guidance for all the world uh, until the end of time. And of course, all the prophets are, uh, are manifestations of God's mercy. I want to use that term, incarnations of God's mercy, right? Not incarnations of God's person. That's a Christian belief, right? Um, that is intimated at least in the New Testament Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, but that's a Christian belief. So uh, the prophets are, are, are examples of God's mercy in the Islamic tradition. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Quran is also called a mercy. That we will make Jesus a, a, a sign of God, a great sign, and a mercy uh, from us. Right? So we're moving from atheism, and of course, atheism uh, is is um, a position of belief. So there's a difference between a position of knowledge and a position of belief, right? There are two positions of knowledge. There's Gnosticism and agnosticism, right? Um, so most atheists, for example, the late Christopher Hitchens, famous atheist, the author of this book, God is Not Great. Um, which has been definitively refuted, by the way, by Berlinski's book, uh, David Berlinski, which you should get. Um, and John Lennox also has an, an extraordinary book as well. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Hitchens always used to refer to himself as an agnostic atheist, meaning that, um, that he is going to live his life under the assumption that there is no God, but he doesn't know for sure cannot prove that there is no God. So he's an agnostic uh, atheist, right? It's very rare to get a Gnostic atheist. In other words, an atheist who, 
who, who knows with certitude that there is no God. And then, of course, you have agnostic believers and agnostic believers as well. So then, that's the first pillar then, right? There's no God but Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger of God. وَتُقِيمُ salah, He says, and to, uh, and to establish the prayer. So this is the second pillar, right? And the prayer, salah, comes from a root word which means to connect. So uh, the prayer is our connection to God. وَتُؤْتِيَ zakah, And to give zakah, to give charity. And the word zakah comes from a word meaning purification. So this is a type of a spiritual purification. وَتَصُومَ Ramadan And to fast the month of Ramadan. Right? One, two, three. This is the fourth pillar. Muslims that are able to will fast the month of Ramadan, the ninth month of the Muslim calendar, as really a commemoration of the Quran, which was, uh, which, whose revelation commenced during the month of Ramadan. وَتَحُجَّ الْبَيْتِ and to make pilgrimage in istata'ata ilayhi sabila, if you're able to do so. And that's the final pillar of Islam, to make pilgrimage to Mecca. So this is the Prophet's answer for what is al-Islam, right? And again, in this context, seems to be referring to sort of the exterior aspect of the religion. It is to say upon the tongue, there is no God but Allah, the Prophet is the messenger of God, to establish the prayer, to give the charity, fast Ramadan and to make Hajj if one is able to do so. And then Qala Sadaqta. Gabriel said, you've answered correctly, or he confirms his answer. And Sayyidina Umar he said, Fa'ajibna lahu yasaluhu wa That was surprising to us that this person is asking the Prophet a question and then he confirms his answer. Right? And this was, you know, you can call this sort of the Socratic method. Right, where the, the teacher already knows the answer, uh, but the teacher wants to honor the student and have the student um, uh, give the correct answer. Now the second question, tell me about al-iman, and which is oftentimes translated as faith. Right, Iman literally means to cause safety. Right? Safeguard your soul. It's, it's related to the Hebrew emunah. Right? So for example, the famous treatise of Maimonides is called the Sherosha uh, Ashar Iqare Emunah. Right? The, the 13 principles of Jewish faith. Right? And of course the word amin is related uh, to this as well. So to safeguard your soul. Right? So this isn't, you know, you know, blind iman doesn't mean that you just believe some in something blindly, believe without evidence. You know, uh, belief without evidence. That's not what it is. It means to accept something um, because the evidence points in that direction, and by doing so, you safeguard your soul in the afterlife. So here in this context. So we have Islam, it's being contrasted with Islam. It seems to be referring to sort of the inward aspect or vertical uh, aspect of the religion. Right? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said in hadith, which is sound hadith, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi al qamaqala, that the quintessential Muslim, right, submitter is the one that. Uh, is 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 he from whose hands and feet? Sorry, hands and tongue, hands and feet, hands and tongue. Other Muslims remain safe. In other words, uh, the true Muslim is not harming. He's not violent uh, with other Muslims, and he's not slandering and backbiting and being calumnious towards other Muslims. That's the quintessential Muslim. And then the Prophet also said, "Al Mu'minu," right? The quintessential believer, right? The quintessential believer. مَنْ أَمِنَهُ النَّاسُ عَلَى دِمَائِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ أو كما قال. That the quintessential mu'min, believer, right, the one who internalizes uh, the faith, is uh, the one uh, that humanity, humanity trusts with their literally blood and possessions. 
lives and property, lives and possessions, right? So the sort of field of compassion and love is expanded. It begins with oneself. That's what it means to be selfish. That's what the word idiot means. Idios means self, right? The idiot only cares about himself. And then it expands, obviously, to the family and the community and, uh, and then to the Muslims and then to, to whole, the whole of humanity, right? The whole of humanity. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said in a famous hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, rigorously authenticated, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. أو كما قال that, that uh, none of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Right? Until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And uh, this that hadith I just mentioned is the source of the hadith, as I said, is in Bukhari and Muslim. But Imam an Nawawi also included it as hadith number 13, I believe, in his Arba'in, in his famous collection of 40 hadith. And in his commentaries, he uh, defines what does it mean? Who is your brother? Right? None of you truly believe until you love, until he loves for his brother. Hatta yuhibba li akhihi. What does that mean? He goes on to say in his commentary, that means your brother, Muslim or Jew or Christian, really your brother in Bani Adam, right, in humanity, right? But he makes that point. And one of my teachers said that there are some manuscripts of uh, Imam Nabawi's um, uh, commentary where that sentence where, where the Imam says Jews and Christians is taken out uh, of, of his of his uh, of, uh, out of his commentary is apparently um, there are some Muslims who don't want other Muslims to think of Jews and Christians as being their brothers, which is unfortunate. So you have this this uh, tampering with these with these commentaries, but that's an authentic saying from the Imam, and that's a sound hadith from the Prophet. So he continues. So what is al Iman? What is faith? Right? What does it mean to safeguard your soul? Qala, the Prophet said, and took me billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa yom al akhir. It is to believe in God, right? Literally to safeguard yourself by means of God, right? Or we can just say to believe in God. And it's not simply to accept the rational proposition that there is a God, right? You know, that's, what, that's what Satan did. Satan accepts uh, that there is a God, right? He accepts that full -hearted, whole, wholeheartedly. Um, but what, what is missing from Satan? Why does the Quran call him a kafir, which means an infidel, if you want, that's a Catholic word, or unbeliever, a rejecter of faith? is because Satan does not have qabul and id'an, right? He doesn't have acceptance. He doesn't accept the guidance that comes from the prophets. He doesn't have submissiveness or humility towards God, right? Um, one of the books in the New Testament, which is very close to Islamic teaching, is the epistle of James. James, obviously, the successor of, of Jesus, according to Christian history. Uh, he probably didn't write this epistle, but it certainly sounds like something that he, he would have written. Uh, seems like someone in his sort of school of thought wrote this epistle. But he says in there that, that even demons believe in God, right? right? So it's, it's not just about what one accepts um, rationally um, or just sort of accepts in oneself but has no... Uh, has no um, uh, motivation to manifest that faith in action, right? So faith and action, very, very important. So to believe in God, then, means not simply to accept things on reason, but to, but to show one's faith, as it were, right? To perform righteous actions. Believe in God and in his angels and in his books, his scriptures, and in his messengers, and in the last day, the, the day of judgment. Al-yawm al-akhir, 
Um, this day of judgment is, has different names in the Quran, Yom al-Qiyamah, like the day of standing, Yom al-Din, the day of judgment, Yom al-Akhir, the final day, the last day, etc. So the Prophet here then gives us these sort of six articles of faith, right? Believe in God, believe in angels, and um, there are uh, four major archangels, Gabriel and Michael, Jibril, Jibril and then Mikael or Mikael, Israfil, which I believe is Seraphiel in the Bible or in, in Israelite tradition, and then Israel. Israel is not Israel, that's Israel. Israel is uh, also the angel of death, uh, and there are other angels uh, mentioned in the tradition as well. As far as the scriptures go, Muslims believe in four major scriptures and many minor scriptures that are sort of um, uh, indicated as well. But the four major scriptures are the Torah of Moses and the Psalms of David, the Zabur, the Injil, the Gospel given to Jesus, peace be upon him. Is that the same as the Christian Gospel? Or is it the same as the New Testament, the four Gospels? It's not an easy question to answer. Um, the dominant opinion from Muslim scholars is that those books, um, that what, what the Christians are calling the gospel, is not the pristine gospel, is not the actual revelation given that Jesus, peace be upon him, although some of the sayings of Jesus could certainly have been preserved in these four books, uh, but that these books, um, they contradict each other, um, uh, and they're written in Greek, which is a foreign language to Jesus. This is sort of the dominant opinion of Muslim scholars. And um, they're written too late, decades later. Of course, there are different ways of looking at these things or counter arguments to those, uh, to those points as well. But this is the dominant opinion. All right. <clears throat> so for example, um, uh, well, there, there are indications in the Quran that, that <clears throat> um, Fabrications, textual fabrications, were committed by Christian scribes and Jewish scribes. Um, and uh, uh, it seems like there's evidence of this if you talk to uh, textual critics of the New Testament. For example, there are, there are manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark that end at chapter 16, verse 8, right? And according to eminent uh, textual critics of the New Testament, that's actually the true ending of Mark. The oldest and best Greek manuscripts end at Mark 16, 8. What does it say in Mark 16, 8? Well, it says that on Easter Sunday, uh, a group of women, three women, they go to the tomb or the sepulcher, um, and they find that the stone has been moved away, and there's an angel sitting inside the tomb, and the angel says to the women, you seek Jesus, who has risen He's gone ahead of you to Nazareth or to Galilee, right? And then Mark says, well, whoever wrote this gospel, he doesn't identify himself, but tradition calls him Mark. Uh, Mark says that the women ran away and they were afraid and they said nothing to no one. And that's the end of the gospel, right? So what, at, what happened? It seems like a cliffhanger. Was Jesus actually resurrected? Um, did he survive the crucifixion and flee the city because he's afraid of authorities? Um, what happened? Um, and then uh, a century or so later, a few decades later, lo and behold, you have subsequent manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark where there's now a, uh, a longer ending, as it's called, verses 9 through 20, where Jesus actually appears to the disciples, to male disciples, and he commissions them to go into all the world. He tells them that they can handle poisonous snakes and and drink poison, and no harm would come to them. That's just one example. <clears throat> so Muslims believe in God, and we'll talk, next week we'll talk about, we'll give a little bit of, uh, a, a little lesson on theology. What do Muslims actually believe about God? Theology, theos and logos, right? Means speech about God. What do Muslims say about God? Who is God? Do do Muslims believe that God is one, uh, a sort of um, 
uh, rigid type of Unitarian monotheism. Do gods believe that there's a plurality, if you will, in the quote-unquote Godhead, as Christians do? Uh, do Muslims believe that God has attributes? What are the attributes? We'll go into a little bit of that. Again, we want to keep it uh, very basic. Belief in God, angels, the revelations given to the prophets in their original form, um, and messengers of God, right? Or Rusulihi, according to Muslim tradition, there have been about 124,000 or so prophets although that number is disputed. As I mentioned, 25 of them mentioned explicitly, 25 or so mentioned in the Quran, and belief in the final day. All right, so belief in God, uh, angels, revelations, messengers, day of judgment, and that's the sixth article of faith. Yeah, and that you believe in Qadr, and Qadr, um, is difficult to translate, divine decree, right? Some people sometimes they translate it as destiny. Uh, I like divine decree or divine apportionment. And notice here the prophet, he repeats, and took me that, that you believe. He repeats that verb um, because qadr uh, is very hard to grasp, right? It's, it's a difficult thing to grasp. Um, that you believe in the, the divine decree, the good and evil of it, right? That everything is from, uh, everything is from God, right? So there's two terms in theology. There's qadar and there's qada. And some of the scholars say that these terms are synonymous. Um, others say that qadar is sort of the measuring out divine apportionment, as we said, God determines all things, uh, and then the qada is the, um, the playing out, if you will, of that, of that uh, divine decree in space-time, uh, in the world, right? So, um, uh, so you had uh, groups in the past that were known as the Jabariya, absolute determinists, who said things like uh, human beings have no free will, um, and so God cannot punish, cannot possibly punish human beings because we have zero volition. Uh, then you have the other extreme, uh, the Qadariya or the absolute libertarians. We're not talking about political libertarianism, which uh, believes that government should not have a lot of intervention, if any, uh, in our lives. No, we're talking about philosophical or theological libertarianism, which espoused that that human beings have absolute free will, um, they create their own actions. In fact, God doesn't even know uh, the juz'iyat or the, um, um, the particulars of, of, uh, of, uh, of things. He only knows sort of uh, the essences of things. So the truth is somewhere in the middle, as they say. Now, as Muslims, we believe that everything is decreed by God. God has perfect knowledge, right? But at the same time, human beings are held accountable for their choices. Sometimes this is called soft determinism or compatibilism, right? That even though everything is determined by God, even though God knows everything and has the power to do whatever he wants, if an action, uh, is, if an action originated within a person themselves, um, uh, from that person's wants and desires, and there are moral implications to that action, then that person is, is taken to account for that action. Ultimately, it's difficult to understand. Ultimately, it's impossible to understand, right? Um, so that's why the scholars say here that, that the prophet repeats the verb, and took me not that you believe, because this is a difficult thing to believe. And it's difficult to think in terms of um, God's power and knowledge, yet he allows us to do certain things and then takes account uh, for our actions. It's a very difficult um, thing to grasp. Um, but uh, it's, it's sort of like explaining um, you know, calculus to 
a toddler or to like a fifth grader, right? They'll get something, they'll get something from it. They'll, there's a very, very limited understanding, but at the end of the day, the intellect really has to make sajda because it has to make a prostration to God uh, because God's qadr, um, his divine decree is beyond our ability to comprehend, right? Um, if God didn't know what we were going to do, then he wouldn't be God. That's not a solution to anything, right? But this is, um, uh, this is something that we can uh, discuss later as well. So it's, it's, it's akin to what philosophers would call like this, this type of soft determinism, right? That you're still taken to account for your choices, but your choices are indeed limited, right? <clears throat> okay, so I think it, that's a good place to stop for tonight, inshallah. We'll finish the hadith next time, and then I'll give you a little bit of theology as well, basic theology in the Islamic tradition, uh, and that'll complete next week. Uh, that'll complete our section on uh, basic beliefs of Islam, and then we'll move in week three into Judaism, inshallah. Last week, we began reading the um, famous hadith, Jibril alayhi salam, the tradition of Gabriel, peace be upon him. And we covered most of the hadith. Just to give you a quick recap, we said that Gabriel, peace be upon him, the archangel, incarnated, basically, um, uh, became a man and uh, came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in the presence of the companions or some of the companions and uh, sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him a series of questions, asked him about al-Islam, which of course is the name of the religion itself, but we said that in the context of this hadith, it seems to be a reference to the exterior uh, element uh, of the religion, that which has to do with the body, um, and then the Prophet Sallallahu answered the question by, uh, by uh, explaining or listing the five pillars uh, of Islam. And then Jibreel Alayhi Salam asked the Prophet Sallallahu a second question about Al-Iman, what is faith? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he um, described the six articles of faith. And that's where we left off. Qala sadaqta. Then Jibreel Alayhi Salam, he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you have spoken the truth. So now we continue the hadith, the famous hadith. And there's a third question that Jibreel alayhi salam asks the Prophet sallallahu What is al-ihsan? Right? And the, the root word uh, here is beauty. Uh, ihsan is translated in a number of ways. Spiritual excellence is one way of translating it. So we said that al-Islam is uh, a reference to sort of the horizontal aspect of the religion, while iman is a reference to the vertical aspect of religion, or that which has to do with the uh, body and the mind. And finally, we have ihsan, the transcendental aspect of the religion, or the relational aspect, or you can say uh, the soul of the religion itself. Um, Al-Ihsan, uh, a technical term for Al-Ihsan is uh, Tasawwuf, um, according to many of the ulama, they are, uh, it's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same thing, they're, they're synonymous, sometimes called Sufism, but when we talk about Sufism, we're talking about Sufism in the context of both Islam and Iman, right? Uh, we're talking about spirituality, um, with a cognizance that the true, that a true spirituality from the context of our religion is grounded in Islam uh, as well as Iman. So tasawwuf is just a, a technical term for al-ihsan, right? Um, the aim, if you will, or the, the, <clears throat> the sort of, if we use Aristotelian nomenclature, the, the, the final cause of the human being uh, in the Islamic tradition is uh, to actualize wilaya, right, or friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, to make oneself 
beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the aim of al-ihsan, of Islamic spirituality. And different Muslim metaphysicians and scholars, they describe the process. Imam al-Ghazali, for example, who writes about tasawwuf amali, uh, a practical Sufism, if you will. Uh, he recommends that Muslims must sit with uh, scholars. They must sit with the spiritual masters and take from their prescriptions, take from their uh, avkar, take from their different litanies and eulogies and remembrances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, one of the great scholars, Ahmad Zarruq, he said that if you don't have a spiritual master, then take a salah ala nabi as your spiritual master. Take the benedictions upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as your spiritual master and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you spiritually by means of the salah ala nabi because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the greatest of spiritual masters. So um, Imam al-Ghazali he talks about you know this sort of three-step process of, um, of purging uh, if you will the, the lower self, the nafs of vice, right? Um, this is called a kenosis in Greek or catharsis uh, via purgativa in the Catholic tradition uh, to purge oneself, to get rid of these vices, right? What are, the, what are some of these vices? What are the vices? These are diseases of the heart, the amrad al qulub the major ones are kibr, like arrogance, and hasad, envy, riya, right? Uh, ostentation. So disciplining the lower self, emptying the self of these, of these vices, but also then ornamenting the self uh, with virtue. This is, uh, so the first one he calls takhliya, this one he calls tahliya, right? To ornament the self, to, to take on virtue. And of course we know the cardinal virtues um, uh, of, you know, adala and shuja'a and hikmah, ifa, but you also have these theological virtues. And Imam al-Ghazali, he enumerates 19 or 21 theological virtues like tawbah, like sabr, like repentance, like, like patience, um, uh, raja, hope, so on and so forth. And then finally you have something called tajliya, right? This is to sort of manifest the divine ethos at a human level, right? This is when the abd becomes a wali, if you will, a friend of God because he mirrors the divine attributes, the divine names and attributes at a level, at the level of a human being, right? So the perfect mirror, if you will, at a, at a human level of God's names and attributes was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in the Quran intimates this when he calls the Prophet by two of his own names. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ رَأُوفُ الرحيم. Right, that the Prophet وسلم, there has come unto you a messenger from among yourselves. It grieves him that you should perish. Deeply concerned is he about you to the believers. He is kind and merciful. Right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar rauf and ar rahim with the definite article. Right, in this sort of absolute sense, in a sense that is beyond human capability, beyond human comprehension. But something of that attribute, right, is reflected in the character, the beautiful character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he said in a hadith, and there's weakness in the hadith, but it's true in its meaning, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ That to ad adorn yourself with the character, if you will, of God, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to him directly in the Quran. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عظيم. Verily, verily, you dominate, right? Ala khuluk. Ala is usually used in grammar to denote something physical, like upon the desk or upon the floor, something like that, upon the roof. But if there is um, an abstract noun that follows ala, then this den denotes a type of mastery or tamakun. So indeed, you have mastered uh, khuluk azim. Great character, magnificent character, because he is a reflection of the divine names and attributes at the human level, right? So like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
speaking to the Prophet in the Quran, Rama Rameta Id Rameta, Wallakinna Allaha Rama. You did not throw when you threw. Allah threw, right? Before the Battle of Badr, you know the famous story. The Prophet وسلم, he picks up some pebbles and he throws them into the direction of the mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, You did not throw when you threw. Right? Very interesting. But Allah threw. What does this mean? Does this mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incarnated into the Prophet وسلم, and undertook this action? That's not what it means. It means that all of the actions of the Prophet, وسلم, however mundane they might seem, all of them are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? He's a sanctified agent of the divine. And this is the goal for all of us. Obviously, we cannot attain the maqamat of, of the prophets, but we can attain, we cannot be prophets, we cannot attain nabuwa, but we can attain wilaya, right? We can become from the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet وسلم, he intimates this in another hadith, which is in Bukhari, which is hadith number 41 of the Arba'in. Arba'in means 40, but Imam and now we included two more hadith, right? Uh, where hadith number 41, where he reports from the Prophet, where the Prophet وسلم, is reported to have said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به. None of you truly believe until his hawa, his hawa is his desires, his caprice, his hawa is in perfect accordance with what I have brought. And what did the Prophet ﷺ bring? He brought the Qur'an and his ethos, the sunnah. In other words, he brought al-huda, he brought the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that is perfect, that's perfect iman. That's, that's an actualized type of, of, of faith, is that your desires and wants are perfectly aligned with what Allah and his messenger wants. This is a definition, if you will, of wilaya reminds me of something Confucius says in the Analects, the Lun Yu, where he says, at, at 50 years old, I understood the mandate of heaven. And at 70 years old, um, he says, um, at 70 years old, I followed my heart's desire without overstepping the line. Right? So he's describing this type of wilaya. And Confucius did believe in God. And um, there the jury is out whether, I mean, he certainly could have been a prophet. There's a good case to make, I think, being Confucius, wallahu alam, just as there's a good case to be made for Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha um, being a khidr mentioned in the Quran, wallahu alam. So this is, this is, in other words, this is mystical union, right? When your desires align with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the term for that is mystical union. Um, and uh, uh, there's other hadith that intimate this, this phenomenon. Hadith number 38, for example, in the Arba'in, also from Bukhari, where the Prophet وسلم, he's reported to have said, let me uh, look at that really quickly here. So this is a hadith Qudsi, this is a sacred hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak in the first person. So an Abi Huraira radi Allahu anhu, it's reported from Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna Allah ta'ala qala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, man aada, when man aada li waliyan faqad aadhantahu bil harb. That uh, Allah says, whoever antagonizes or shows enmity towards my wali, towards my friend, right? Again, wilaya is the final cause of the human being according to um, the uh, philosophy of Islam, if you will, or the psychology of Islam. Uh, the one who antagonizes this friend of God, and I have announced to him war from me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, declares war on the person uh, who uh, antagonizes the friends of God. It's interesting, you have a, you know, a plethora of, of Christian and, uh, Christians and atheists who are basically working full time on the internet, uh, trying to discredit and denounce the Prophet Wasallam. Basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's an everyday verbal assault. You have YouTube channels with thousands upon thousands of, of prescribers. This is something that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, or subscribers, this is something that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, 
uh, tells us about in the Quran. This is what he says is going to happen. This is just natural. That indeed, indeed, in Arabic is, is a lot of emphasis. Indeed, indeed, you will hear a lot from those who received the revelation before you, the Ahlil Kitab and the Mushrikeen, which is interesting. The Quran doesn't necessarily affirm atheism. There were very, very, very few atheists in the, in the ancient world. There were a few, but the Quran does not entertain atheism. Everyone worships something. You're either from Ahlul Kitab, or you're a believer, or you're a mushrik, right? So if you say, for example, the universe created itself, you're assigning to the universe a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're saying that the universe created itself. It's the khaliq of it, or it's the khaliq, first of all. But then he said, no, the universe didn't create itself. The universe always existed. It has a sort of uh, um, uh, internal uh, pre-eternality. That's called al-qidm al-dhati, an essential pre-eternality. That's an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are mushrikeen, basically. That's, that's called shirk, right? So you're going to hear a lot from people of different faiths, from people that are mushrikeen, that is going to grieve you. Adhan kathira, right? A lot of sort of white noise. In tasbiru wa tattaqu fa inna dhalik min azmi al-umur. But if you show patience, great theological virtue, and you guard against evil, right? You guard yourself from this type of thing, uh, then that will be the uh, determining factor of all affairs. And this doesn't mean that you can't ask questions to seek, you know, clarifications. Asking questions does not necessarily does not necessarily come from a place of doubt, right? We have to remember that as well. Someone asking questions, even if they're difficult questions, uh, does not necessarily mean that this person is having issues with their iman or something like that, um, that we should constantly seek to fortify uh, our iman. But anyway, cont continuing the hadith, this hadith Qudsi, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا إِفْتَرَضْتُهُ عَلَيَّ that my servant does not draw close unto me. Now again, the speaker here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the tongue of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. My servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved by me than his fara'id, right? His obligatory acts of worship. <clears throat> and he continues, And he continues to draw close unto me with his nawafil, with his uh, supererogatory acts of worship, right? So you have the five pillars of Islam, these are the fara'id, and then you have nawafil, you have extra. You have the, for example, the five daily Right, the mustahab days, the sunnah days. And you have sadaqah extra. You have the Hajj, which is Fard. You have Umrah, which is extra. That leaves one pillar, the Shahada. Shahada is essentially a form of dhikr. You say it on the tongue, as we said. You testify on the tongue. What is the nafila of the Shahada? It is adhkar. It is dhikr, dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and additional as ala nabi it is eulogies and benedictions upon the Prophet ﷺ, right? So the beloved of actions are fara'id. But then this, the hadith Qudsi says, to draw near unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the extra credit as you will. The nawafil hatta uhibba until I love him or her, the masculine is used here, right? The, the, the female gender is encapsulated uh, in the masculine gender, it's understood to be there. Until I love him. Until, this is God speaking. Until I love him. And then he says, and when I love him, kuntu sam'uhu allati yasma'u bi. And when I love him, right? Fa'idha ahabuhu, when I love him, I become his hearing, by which he sees, and his butar, and his sight, by which he, uh, sorry, his hearing by which he hears, and his sight by which he sees, uh, biha, and his hand uh, by which uh, he strikes, and his foot 
is rijl, alati yamshi biha, by which he walks. And if he were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. Right? If he were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. And, he continues, if he were to ask me for refuge, I should surely grant him it. Right? So this, uh, that hadith is in Bukhari, it's a sound hadith, hadith Qudsi. So going back to the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, Okay. And the Prophet وسلم, this is the gives here a beautiful description. So the Prophet says, Al Ihsan, spiritual action, affection of the soul, the relational aspect of the religion, the soul of the religion. It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you see him, as if you see him. And if you, uh, and if you don't see him, indeed he sees you, right? So, as if one is raptured in the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give you a basic worldly example. If your boss comes into your office and says, make a sale right now, and he sits down in your office and he watches you, how excellent of a sales call will you make? Right? That's just your boss at work, right? who you might not even like very much as a person. But when you worship, <clears throat> worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then know Know in your very being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. And then he says, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Right? So there's a fourth question. Sometimes we can push the pause button on this hadith. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, pause. But there's one more question. Uh, one more major question. There's actually five questions. But one more major question. What, uh, so tell me about a sa'a, the hour, i.e. the day of judgment. The hour, right? Uh, the word hour in English comes from the Greek hora. This is the same word that's used uh, for the day of judgment in the New Testament, for example, which is written in Greek. Um, so it begins with a omega, but there's rough breathing. So hora, that's why there's an H uh, when we say hour. So tell me about the hour. And he understood this question to mean, when is the hour? Right? Now the hour is close. The Prophet Kahatain, and he put up these two fingers. Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi Wasallam. The hour and myself are very close like this. So he is the eschatological prophet. He is the first of the major signs of the hour. His coming is the first major sign of a sa'a. Right? When you look at the entire history of humanity. It's very, very close. So the Prophet Sallallahu answer is, مَلْ مَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The mas'ul, the one who is being asked the question, right, the one who is being questioned, knows no more than the questioner, the, sa the sa'il, meaning Jibreel alayhi salam. Nobody knows the exact time of the sa'a. This is a secret that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has kept for himself. Right? Uh, in the Quran, it says, they ask you concerning the sa'a. When will it be established? قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ Rabbi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet wasallam to say, the knowledge of the sa'a is only with my Lord. The knowledge of the sa'a is only with my Lord. So nobody knows. Nobody knows when it is. In fact, in the New Testament, you have this saying that is attributed to Isa alayhi salam in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36, when he says, of that day, right, of that day knoweth no man, not the angels, not even the Son, but only the Father. Now, before we continue, we have to understand here that these terms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these are Hebraisms. You actually find these terms, these sort of ingredients of the Trinity, the ingredients of the Trinity, 
right? Not the doctrine of the Trinity. The ingredients and these terms, the nomenclature of Trinitarian Christianity is found in the Old Testament, but they have different meanings. So what the early Christians did is they took these terms, they appropriated them and redefined them through a Trinitarian lens. So in the Old Testament, in Jewish texts, even at the time of Isa alayhi salam, this is, this is a, a Jewish prophet in a Jewish environment, right? When Jews called uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the father, what that meant was ab, uh, sorry, what that meant was rab. So ab, father, means rab, right? Isaiah chapter 64, 16. Atta Adonai avinu, you are the Lord, our father. This is totally majaz. Is figurative language, right? It's figurative. No one means this. No Jewish prophet. Isaiah did not mean that in a literal sense, that God is a literal father, or God is my literal father, or that God is the literal father of anyone. And when I say literal father, I not only mean in the literal physical sense, but I mean any, that anyone shares a nature with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone shares find quality with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody does. We'll get into some of this uh, theology. And then the word son, right? You find this in the Old Testament. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the Psalms, God says to David, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. What does that mean? What does it mean to, to be a uh, uh, ben Adonai, ben Elohim, right? Uh, Ibn Allah, what, is, what does that mean in a Jewish context? It simply means abd. It means slave or servant, right? And it's a great maqam to be a servant of Allah. It's a great station to be the servant of Allah. It's not like when we, you know, we use these terms slave. People think of, you know, slave in the American context, like chattel slavery. That's what it is, right? Because in that type of relationship, the slave is uh, dehumanized, humiliated, uh, and the only one that benefits is the slave master. But in the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the slave is honored. And he benefits, the slave benefits. We cannot benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one iota. There's nothing that we can do that can possibly benefit him. We take all the benefit. So it's a great maqam to be the abd par excellence. And the Prophet sallallahu took great pride in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently refers to him in the Quran as his abd. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Right? <clears throat> so, son, in a Jewish context, son means abd, means servant, evid adonai, right? And, uh, and father in a Jewish context means rab, right? So we have to keep that uh, in mind. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the son, right? Because in the New Testament, he refers to himself uh, more often than not as the son of man. Um, and there's different ways of interpreting that. It seems to be a a way of stressing his humanity, or just a way of saying prophet, or just human being. Uh, but sometimes the son. Now, this could be obviously, uh, there could be um, uh, um, alterations that the text has suffered. But again, keeping things in a Jewish context, if he's the son, right? So first of all, he says, we're all children of God, right? Sermon on the Mount, in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, also in the, bu uh, the book of Luke. In the Aramaic, he says, Avunda Vashmayo, our Father who art in heaven. They ask him, how do we pray? He says, pray like this, Avunda Vashmayo, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be, hallowed be thy name. Right? Our Father, not just his Father, all of us. And again, Ab means Rab. So I would actually translate that. The meaning of that is Rabbana. Rabbana, O oh our Lord. That's what it means. Right? So what does it mean then for Jesus to be the Son or you know, monogenes huias, you know, the one-of-a-kind son. What does that mean? Well, Christians take that to mean that he's the second person of a triune Godhead. But it simply means that he's the Messiah, right? Isa alayhi salam has this unique title. He's a unique abd. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is also a unique abd. And Musa alayhi salam is a unique abd, right? Unique abd, unique slave of God. So anyway, Going back to this idea of the sa'a, I have to explain this sort of before we get into this. So Matthew 24, 36, he says, um, of that day knoweth no man, right? Not the angels, ude hahuias in the Greek, not even the son, not even the Messiah, not even this unique servant 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning himself, but only the father, only the Rabb, only the Rabb knows this, the, this, the sa'a, the day he calls it, al-yawm, yawm azim. So Isa alayhi salam here, according to a Christian text, which is a canonical text, authoritative text, the Gospel of Matthew, the most, uh, the most popular gospel in all of antiquity, admits he doesn't know. Now what's really interesting is, later scribes, they removed that, that statement, ude hahuias, from manuscripts of Matthew's gospel. Later Greek manuscripts, they omit that. So Jesus says, of that day knoweth no man, not the angels in heaven, but only the Father. Which still doesn't help, really, because the Son is not the Father. You can't say that. The Father is the same person as the Son. That's a violation of Trinitarian theology. But these scribes, whenever they were, probably 2nd, 3rd century, they found it very troubling that Jesus, who's supposed to be God, doesn't know something because ilm mutlaq, right? Very important concept. God has these sort of omni-attributes, right? He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's all-knowing, right? This is called a qualitative attribute of God. God has certain attributes um, that qualify him as being deity. One of them is omniscience. Sifatul ma'ani, we call them in Arabic, right? Ilm mutlaq, perfect knowledge. Does it increase? Does it decrease? It's perfect. So the fact that Isa alayhi salam, according to this Christian text, whether it's authentic or not, Allahu alam, it doesn't really make a difference to us, right? Um, whether it's authentic or not. But according to this text, he admits that he doesn't know something. And if he's God, he's supposed to know everything. <clears throat> Of course, in Numbers 23, 19, uh, this is in the Torah, or the modern-day Torah. Numbers 23, 19, uh, it says, Lo ish el, God is not a man, right? that he should lie. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man is just three words. I always have my students memorize it. Lo ish el, go, God is not a man. Lo ish el, not a man is God. That he should lie is the rest of that statement. So Christians, how do Christians deal with this statement? God is not a man that he should lie. They say, yeah, God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, God can become a man, and he did become a man. Uh, he became Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, and Jesus never lied about that. Right? But that's not the actual meaning of that verse in Hebrew. And this is something that rabbinical authorities point out in their debates with Christians. This goes all the way back to like the third century. Rabbi Abahu of Caesarea who used to debate Christian apologists, he said, that's not the meaning of it. The meaning is, whoever claims, any man who claims to be God, he's a liar. Right? So that's the meaning of it. God is not a man that he should lie. Any man, any human being who claims to be God is a liar. And that's not the only place. You have Hosea chapter 11, verse 9. Ki anuchi el vilo ish. Indeed, I am God and not a man. They are two mutually exclusive entities. Right? So the Prophet says, The one who is being questioned knows no more than the questioner. And he continues. So now we have uh, yet another question. So Islam, Iman, right? Ihsan, Asa'a. Now a fifth question, a clarifying question, number five, maybe just, you know, 4, 4A, question 4A. فَأَخْبِرْنِ عَنْ أَمَارَاتِهَا So tell me about, okay, you don't know when is the sa'a, but tell me its signs and portents, right? So why is this important? Because we need to recognize the signs of our times, right? And be able to guard or protect ourselves against evil. That's why there's a very fairly large corpus of what's known as eschatological literature in our tradition. The Prophet ﷺ, he spoke a lot about the portents of the sa'a and the fitan, the trials and tribulations that are going to manifest towards the end of time. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he's not just a bashir, he's, he's not just a, a bearer of glad tidings. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. Shahidan wa mubashir. He gives the bushra. Wa nadira. 
and a warner. He's here to warn us about things. So the Prophet ﷺ, he gives us warning. This is part of his vocation as a prophet. So what does the Prophet ﷺ, what does he say? He says, Ajib statement. He says that the uh, slave girl or the low-born, base-born girl will give birth to her mistress. Mistress means female master, right? That a girl will give birth to her mistress or master. So the ulama, they have difference of opinion about this, but generally they say that the meaning of this is that towards the sa'a, there's going to be sort of a flood of what's known as filial recalcitrance. The opposite, the opposite of birul walidain, the opposite of filial piety, which is so important, and everything starts at home. All of uh, Confucius's philosophy begins with birul walidain, right? You know, so this bolsters or buttresses our case for Luqman al Hakim as being look uh, as being Confucius because he's giving advice to him. Ya bunaya, ya ya bunay, la tushrik billah. Inna shirka la dhulmun adim. Ya bunayya. Right? He's teaching his chil, his son, his children. So filial recalcitrance. So you have this idea now, this kind of postmodern philosophy that's floating around in colleges and universities, uh, society in general, this idea of radical, absolute egalitarianism in the society, which has never worked. History has shown it's never worked. Uh, hierarchical structures are very important to society. Those work, and they're, they're tried and they're tested. That there's always going to be. When you can't equalize people. It's just not going to happen. People have different abilities. People are born into different types of uh, uh, class and status and wealth. There's always going to be a khas and an am. There's always going to be you know, a, a noble class or the, the nobility, the nobles, if you will influential, wealthy, and, there, and there's going to be the, the am, the laity or the commoners. That's how it works. Hierarchies work. They work in the workplace. They work in, in educational institutions. And they work in the family. This, the, the, the study that I cite oftentimes, uh, Charles University in Prague, where the researchers dis discovered that, that um, households where one spouse is dominant over the other those households tend to be happier and have more children. But what do I mean by dominant? I don't mean that one spouse is oppressing the other one. I mean there's a clear sort of social hierarchy within the family, a chain of command, where the person at the top, they are, uh, they're magnanimous in the way that they treat their family, but the buck, as it were, stops at that person. They have the sort of final say within the household. And this, this study found that 72% of those happy families were male dominated. So there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al qawwamuna ala nisa. You know, the Quran is not trying to be misogynistic and, uh, and you know, um, because that's, you know, this, this whole, a whole idea of patriarchy and we need to smash it and, and build up. A, I mean, good luck with that. These things are not going to work, right? Um, so this idea, of, of you know, children now ruling their parents, right? Um, I just saw a thing on the news the other day. There's a show on Netflix. I think it's called The Babysitter's Club or something like that, where you have this you know, eight-year-old uh, boy who's in the hospital, biological boy, and you have these doctors that are treating this patient be, as, as a boy. And then one of, one of his friends or someone, a girl, comes in and says, can I talk to you, two doctors outside? And this girl, who's like 10 years old or something, the friend of this boy who's sick, begins to just lecture these, these grown adult physicians. I don't care what your chart says. Look at her. It's a girl. You know, treat her like a girl. You're being violent or something. You're, you're creating an unsafe space for this girl. It's actually a girl. So now we just kind of live in make-believe land. And the doctors are sitting there, doctors, physicians, in their 50s, listening to this 10-year-old girl lecture them, oh, okay, you're right, you're right. Very, very strange. <clears throat> okay, so uh, 
And then he says, وَأَن تَرَى الْحُفَاتَ الْعُرَاتَ الْعَالَ رِيَعَ الشَّائِ يَتَتَوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ So that's the first one he says. The Prophet Wasallam. he says, the, the slave girl will, will give birth to her master. And then he says something interesting. You will see the barefooted, naked, destitute herdsmen competing uh, in the construction of lofty buildings. Right? So... Why these two signs? Why these two portents? So the scholars say that, well, one will come very quickly and one will come later. Or one will come within the family and one will manifest uh, in the society. The, the barefoot, naked, destitute shepherds, herdsmen, competing in the construction of lofty buildings, right? So in other words, hubba dunya, love of the world, the New Testament, uh, love, uh, love of mammon, Right, that's how Isa Islam, at least according to the New Testament, puts it. You know, uh, the the hadith says, "Hubbut dunya, love of the world, ratsu uh, kulli khatia, is the head of every type of sin. Love of the world, right? So this idea of you know shepherds, naked, barefoot, now competing in lofty buildings, it means that hubbut dunya can take root even in the most unlikely of places." In the most unlikely of places, simple shepherds, Bedouins living in the desert in tents are now fully engrossed in love of mammon, as it were, love of the world, right? There's a surah of the Quran uh, that, uh, that we, uh, we know very well, but we seldom contemplate. Surah 102, at takathur What does at takathur mean? It comes from kathir. It's form six verb which denotes this kind of reciprocal action. So you have this sort of mutual competition or rivalry, right? For stuff, for kathra, for a lot of stuff. al takathur, the Quran says. That this, this mutual competition or consumerism amongst yourselves deludes you or distracts you, right? It distracts you. Until you visit the graves, right? And the meaning is either until you go into your grave, and that's really when you wake up. Because Sayyidina Ali said, human beings are asleep, and when they die, they wake up. That's when the yaqeen. Or it means that, you should go to the graveyard. When you actually go visit a graveyard, that's when people start putting things in perspective. Right? That's why we should go to funerals. Somebody dies in your community and there's a janaza prayer. Go to the graveyard. Go look at the burial. Right? And this, you know, takathur, this idea of, of, of competition, you know, you have a perfectly good phone. You know, you, you gotta buy another phone. Because your, your cousin has a, a, the latest iPhone. Your phone is perfectly good. But no, you have to compete with this person. And that's just in, you know, in one little gadget. For people like this, they spend their entire lives just takathur. Very interesting. So the Prophet وسلم, his two portents that he gives us, right? He tells us basically, number one, there's going to be a major breakdown of social structures, right? We're going to enter into a type of social chaos. And then we're going to, uh, there's going to be a sort of dominance of materialism. People will fall into total materialism, right? And another thing he said, it's not mentioned in the hadith here, in the hadith of Jibreel, but the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there are other signs, other portents of the Sa'a, the coming of the Antichrist is one of them. If you look at Isa alayhi salam, if you look at our Christology, Isa alayhi salam, according to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu his message is, is uh, ukhrawi, it's, it's otherworldly, right? He's talking about mot, about death, he's talking about akhirah, he's talking about purifying the self, you know, he says the dunya is like a bridge, hurry up and cross over it. He says the world is like a man who's at sea, uh, trapped on a, on a, on a boat completely lost sea, he starts taking handful after handful of seawater into his mouth. 
which is representative, symbolical for the dunya. The more he drinks, the more thirstier he gets, and then it kills him. Right? He says the world is like a haggard old prostitute who sticks her hand out from behind a wall, which is all you know, bejeweled with rings and, and, uh, and nail polish and, and bangles and wave and over to her. So the men go, they, they go and they look around the corner and then she grabs them and slaughters them. That's the nature of the dunya. Right? So the Antichrist then, the uh, Messiah at Dajjal, his message is the, is the polar opposite of Isa alayhi salam is that salvation is through materialism. This is all there is, so just enjoy your life, right? And this is, you know, you know the, the barefooted, naked, destitute herdsmen competing uh, in the construction of lofty buildings. That's how the Prophet Sallallahu described uh, this, um, this phenomenon, in a very dramatic sort of way of putting it. And then he says, ثُمَّ إِنْ تَلَقَى فَلَبِثْتُ مَلِيًا Sayyidina Umar, he says, then this man left and I stayed for a while and the Prophet ﷺ, he came to me and said, Ya Umar, at-tadri man is sail Do you realize who the questioner was? And Sayyidina Umar, he says, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam Allah and his messenger know best. فَإِنَّهُ Jibril. Indeed, he was Jibril alayhi salam. Yes. The age of Horus, indeed. This is what uh, Crowley says in the Liber Leges. Alistair Crowley, one of these sort of hidden figures that have so much, that has um, influenced American or Western society, now world, the world, in such an incredible way. The founder of the modern religion of Thelema, which is a type of Satanism, right? He wrote this book called the Liber Legis, which he claimed was dictated to him by a shaitan, by a, a demon named Awas, which is interesting, sounds like Waswas. And in that book, he says, um, you know, Crowley says that we're going to enter into the age of Horus, the age of the child, right? The dominance of the child. In other words, an, an age of, of, of a lack of discipline, an age of, of just just following the hawa, right? Following the nafs, uh, an age that there, where it's unreasonable because the, the, the purpose of the aqal, aqal means to bind something. Ya'aqil means to, like the, to the hobble a camel. I'aqilha, the Prophet ﷺ said about the camel running around outside the masjid. So whose camel is that? He, the Bedouin said, that's my camel. Atawakkalu ala Allah. I've trusted Allah. He said, tie her down. Right? The intellect is supposed to tie down and control the nafs, the hawa, the caprice. This goes all the way back to Plato. We've mentioned this before. The rational soul has to, has to be in the driver's seat to, to, to keep the appetitive soul and the striving soul in check. But it's the age of Horus. <clears throat> I'm sorry if there's problems with the audio. Uh, I'm the only one here today. Um, Inshallah, we can work that out. Um, God incarnate is an Aryan and Greco-Roman concept. Well, <clears throat> Arianism is, is um, it's hard to, un it's hard to uh, pin down Aryan Christology. It's, God incarnate is certainly a Trinitarian belief. That's Orthodox Christianity, right? Um, Incarnatus est, it says in the Nicene Creed, it says in the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed that God came down and assumed flesh. That's what that means, incarnation. What did Arius actually believe? Um, most of his writings are lost, with the exception of yeah. Most of our information about Arius comes from his opponents, which you can't really trust. Can you really trust your opponents to reproduce? Even according to Tarmo Tum, a Christian theologian who wrote the book, um, it's a very good book, if I can think of the title, uh, classic, Classical Trinitarian Theology. Right? He says in that book, Tum, T-O-O-M, he says that it's, it's known that many of the early church fathers, they would, um, 
They would uh, belie Arius. They would, they would misquote him. They would quote him out of context. Uh, but something that seems to be from Arius, because it's in the Nicene Creed, is the belief that Isa alayhi salam, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that uh, the, the Son of God, and he used that term, but not in the Trinitarian sense, that the Son of God, there was a time when the Son did not exist, right? That was sort of the, the, the credo of the, of the Arians. It's according to the Nicene Creed. In Greek, ein pate hate uk ein. There was a time when he was not. There was a time when he, the Son of God, was not. And Arius referred to Christ as kitisma, creation. The Son is created. He used the term, right? Um, so that's sort of one way of looking at Arianism. The other way of looking at it is, well, okay, that might have been true, but um, did Arius somehow still um, give the Son some sort of semi-divine or demigod uh, status um, to the, I mean, that's certainly how some of the early church fathers portray him, that the early church fathers, ironically, uh, are defending monotheism in the face of what they believe is a type of bitheism, which is being espoused by the Arians. Right, so Trinitarian monotheism for the early church fathers is a real type of monotheism, whereas what Arius was saying is that Arius is trying to propose that there are actually two gods, the Father and the Son. I think that's probably a misrepresentation of Arianism. I think Arius believed, um, based on <clears throat> what uh, occurs to me as far as my research, that Arius believed that the Son was, was created at some point, that katisma teleon, he calls him, the best of creation. Right? That was, that was Arius. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, he says, that was Gabriel. He came to you to teach you your religion. And that's the end of the hadith. Right? <clears throat> now, I only have a few minutes left. I want to just uh, read a few statements from the beautiful creed, a very ecumenical, popular creed of Imam Abu Ja'far at tahawi um, the, the world famous creed, which is derived from the Quran, the Mutawatir, the multiply attested hadith of our Master Muhammad, وسلم, and the Ijma, uh, the, the consensus of the first three generations, the Salaf of the Muslim Ummah. Just read very quickly here. He says so, number one, and of course, uh, creed, the word creed comes from the Latin credo, which means I believe. Right? Uh, so uh, creed in Arabic is aqida, which is related to the Hebrew word aqida, right? The binding of Isaac, Genesis 22, right? To bind something, that's what the, the root is, wahlul uqaddatam mil lisani, right? Release the sort of t knot from my tongue, which is the prayer of Musa. So these are, these are beliefs that are binding upon us. It's just a, li a list of our beliefs. This is the aim of the creedal theologian, right? The aim of the creedal theologian is simply to articulate our basic beliefs, just a list of our beliefs. And it's different than ilmul kalam, right? Ilmul kalam, or dialectical theology, or possibly a better translation. I don't like speculative theology, but discursive theology. The aim of the discursive theologian, the mutakallim, is to reconcile our belief our sacred texts with reason, right? So it's not just, you know, we believe in God and this is who God is. It's, you know, um, is belief in God reasonable? Is belief in revelation reasonable? Is belief in angels reasonable? Right, so here Imam Tahawi, he's assumed the role of a, of a, a creedal theologian, right? So he's not gonna get into a lot of discussion, a lot of, um, dialectics, if you will. So he begins by saying, God is one and he has no partner. And some of the ulama say here that wahid here denotes a sort of internal oneness of God, that he's one quote unquote person, using the person 
as an entity which has a personality. One entity, right, persona or hypostasis in, in Greek. Uh, in other words, the sort of Godhead in Islam is a simple unity, rigidly one, Unitarian monotheism. In Christianity, um, when it comes to the essence, attributes, and actions of God, so in our tradition, no one shares in the essence and attributes and actions of God. No one has the essence, attributes, or actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is rigidly one, in internal oneness. He is wahid. In Christianity, three hypostases, three persons, share in the essence, the attributes, and actions of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَ Don't say three. Thalatha doesn't mean trinity. It could mean trinity. But it means three. Don't say three. Whether it's three gods, right? In other words, like a sort of uh, Neoplatonic or Middle Platonic um, hierarchy of being, where there's, it's really more henotheistic, where there's one major god, but then there's two sort of minor gods that are, that are effects of the major god or the one, right? So the godhead is sort of three distinct gods that have similar essence. Don't say that. Don't say one essence and three persons. So this verse, the way that it's worded is, is, is incredible because not only is it denouncing Trinitarian monotheism, but also these types of middle platonic uh, henotheistic tritheism, all of these types of things, because that was also very popular. This predates Christianity. Middle platonic philosophers, they talked about the one, they talked about the... Um, you know, who, who, who caused from his being the logos, they use that term, or the noose, the word, and, and through self-intellection, this kind of emanation. And then you have another emanation from the, from the logos, from the noose, that created this, the, the, what they call the uh, psuche, the psyche, the spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Christianity is heavily influenced by Middle and, and, and Neoplatonism. To the point where in the Gospel of John, you see that word. In the beginning was the Logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Again, we, so what we have with Christianity, you have an appropriation of Jewish terminology redefined through a Trinitarian lens. You also have an appropriation of Hellenistic philosophy and theology um, uh, redefined. Uh, through a Trinitarian lens, right? So with the New Testament books, especially John, you have sort of one hand on Plato and Aristotle and the other hand on the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And it's really sort of marrying the two together. This is why Imam al-Ghazali warns us in the Tahafat al falasifa that it's very, very dangerous to get into these, to get into Hellenistic metaphysics. He's not an anti-scholastic. Imam al-Ghazali says in that text, he says, I'm not against, you know, um, uh, you know, you know the, the, the hard sciences, the natural science. That has nothing to do with your religion, right? He says, if, if a, if a uh, scientist comes up to you and says, you can predict uh, the, the eclipse of the moon or something, that's fine. Don't argue with him. But steer clear of Hellenistic metaphysics. Because look what it did to Christianity. And look what it did to Judaism as well. Philo of Alexandria, highly influenced, middle Platonic philosopher, who talks about a deuteros theos, a second god that he calls the Logos, right? He lived in Egypt and Alexandria. That's probably where the Gospel of John was written as well. Anyways, I'm out of time. Inna Allah wahidun la sharika lah. That's the essence of the theology. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufuan ahad. So next week, inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue and we'll go into Judaism. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.